Welcome back to Face the Nation. We continue our conversation with Ambassador Robert O'Brien, National Security Advisor to President Trump. Um, I, I want to pick up on this idea uh, where we left it with Turkey coming, and they are a NATO ally, as you emphasized. One of our NATO allies, uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, said this week that NATO is suffering a brain death because of lack of American support and resolve. From what he's seeing and then what we're seeing with Turkey causing these cracks in the alliance, I mean, you must be very concerned. Is that why you've brought the NATO secretary general to the White House this week as well? Well, we have a NATO summit coming up uh, the 3rd and 4th of December, so we'll be in London for that summit. I, accept, I think it's going to be a good summit between NATO allies. NATO is an important al alliance to us, but look, I think the cracks that have, that have formed in the alliance are because we have members of the alliance that aren't paying their fair share, that aren't spending money on defense. I mean, the, the United States taxpayer and, and the taxpayer of eight of the NATO countries, taxpayers of eight of the NATO countries that are spending their 2 percent on national defense, we spend over 4 percent. They're doing the right things, but there are a bunch of countries, including Germany and others, that, that aren't paying their fair share. It's not, it's not right for the American taxpayer to have to defend these countries that don't want to defend themselves. So, so the president has been very, very strong on this issue. There's been $100 billion in new NATO defense spending since he took office. That's mm -hmm. a great accomplishment of President Trump. I think the Americans are happy about it, and I think most Europeans are happy about it. Well, Emmanuel Macron was voicing out loud some real concerns. And if you look at what Turkey has done, as you just described, you thought that there was a potential NATO ally would fire on the United States, intentionally or not, in Syria. You've also seen Turkey go ahead and buy Russian-made weapons yeah. in defiance of NATO. Yeah, we're, we're very upset about that. And, can and can you get behind sanctions on them? Well, I mean, they're well, supposed to be triggered by Congress. Well, look, look, if the, if Turkey doesn't get rid of the S-400, I mean, there will likely be sanctions. The CATSA sanctions will, will pass com Congress with an overwhelming bipartisan majority, and Turkey will feel the impact of those sanctions. We've, we've made that very clear to President Erdogan. There's no place in NATO for the S-400. There's no place in NATO for significant Russian military purchases. That's a, a message that the president will deliver to him very clearly when he's here in Washington. I know you're just back from Asia. Um, the president says he wants to meet with Xi Jinping and possibly get a trade deal by December. Is that a hard date on the uh, calendar? Look, there, there's no deadline. We want to get a good deal. And I think we're very close to getting a phase one trade deal. And it will be the first time that we've had a, a trade deal where China has actually respected uh, the United States and, and hasn't you know, stole our intellectual property, has been fair and reciprocal in trade. So if we can get a, a good deal, then we'll get a good deal. I think we're very close. I, and I think if there is a deal, the president and President Xi will, will get together and sign it. Look, we want great relations with China, but this is the first president that stood up to China that, that has been, you know, stealing American intellectual property, not allowing American companies to have access to Chinese markets, uh, engaging in unfair trade practices. That has to come to an end because the Chinese have been using that to fill to, to, to fund one of the most massive military buildups in history. Right. And, 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 you know, that has to come to a stop. Well, as I just said, you're back from Asia. You've been raising concerns about China's militarization, particularly of the South China Sea. I mean, this only seems to be escalating militarily. Well, I don't think it's escalating militarily. I think that the president put tariffs on, on China. We've always, you know, and, and, and those tariffs have led the Chinese to the negotiating table. And I think we're going to get a pretty good deal for the American people, especially for the American farmers, for owners of intellectual so, property. So you see a trade deal going ahead. And what you're talking about in terms of militarization in the South China Sea, that kind of thing is not going to complicate. Look, we're, we're going to still stand up. And I, I did at the ASEAN summit, at the East Asia summit, I made it very clear that that just because one country is big and other countries are small in the region, the bigger countries shouldn't bully the smaller countries and, and take their resources, whether they're fishery resources or oil and gas resources. And the U.S. Navy will continue to have freedom of, op of navigation operations through the South China Sea. The, this nine-dash line or cow's tongue that the Chinese have, mm -hmm. have drawn around the entire South China Sea, which is a major swath of the Pacific Ocean, and claimed it as internal waters as if it was Lake Tahoe or something, that just can't stand. The United States Navy won't put up with it. The, the countries in the region, region won't put up with it. And, and all of those countries, were, with, with very few exceptions, were grateful because that America is standing up for them, standing up for their resource patrimony. That's the future for their kids and their grandkids, with the oil and gas and the fisheries and the minerals off their shores. China shouldn't be allowed to take it just because they're bigger. You, um, on Ukraine, I know you were not at the White House when this July 25th phone call happened that is now at the heart of this impeachment inquiry, but you are now part of Ukraine policy making. Uh, you heard Senator Graham at the top of the program say the policy is completely incoherent. Will the U.S. continue lethal military aid to Ukraine until Russia backs out of Crimea 
and, and stops supporting separatists in Ukraine. Well, look, I think you put your finger on the most, most important issue, and that's lethal military aid. Uh, I was in Ukraine in 2014. I was there to observe the elections in Ukraine. I was there as part of a bipartisan election observation mission. And I had young Ukrainian soldiers and young Ukrainians come up to me and say, why won't the U.S., the arsenal de democracy, send us lethal aid? You're sending us blankets and MREs. Why won't right. President Obama send us military aid? And President Trump and, changed and there, policy and there, by doing And there that. was no military aid going to, to the Ukrainians under the, the, the Obama-Biden administration. Mm -hmm. uh, when President Trump got into office, he sent military aid. So I think what people ought to be focusing on is the president has been helping the, the Ukrainians defend themselves by sending them lethal, lethal military aid to stand up to the Russians. That's the real story that's been but lost in all of this. But is the policy, though, that, that that lethal aid will continue until Russia stops backing separatists and, and trying to annex parts of Ukraine? Well, I, I'm not getting into hypotheticals about what could happen down the road. I mean, hopefully Russia and Ukraine can get along and there can be some sort of a peace treaty and, and an agreement between them. So I'm not going to commit the United States to what we're going to do forever. But, but for right now, we're, sent, we're, we're the first administration. President mm -hmm. Trump is the first president to send lethal military aid to Ukraine. I think it's very important, and I think that's something that's been lost in, in all the hullabaloo about the, uh, uh, about the telephone call. And, and one other thing I'd say about this, I've been with President Trump in two dozen conversations, either in person or on the phone with foreign leaders. And if the American people could be on those phone calls, they'd be extraordinarily proud of the president, how he represents America, the cordiality that he, he has with world mm -hmm. leaders, but also the tough message that he has to, to protect U.S. interests. I mean, they, they'd be proud of what their president does in those meetings with foreign leaders. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who has testified under oath, is serving on the National Security Council currently. Will he continue to work for you despite testifying against the president? Well, well, look, one of the things that I've talked about is that we're streamlining the National Security Council. It got bloated to like 236 people from up from 100 in the Bush administration under President Obama. We're streamlining the National Security Council. There are people that are detailed from different departments and agencies. My understanding is he's, uh, that uh, Colonel Vindman is, uh, is detailed from the Department of Defense. So everyone who's detailed at the NSC, people are going to start going back to their own departments and we'll mm -hmm. bring in new folks, but we're going to get that number down to around 100 people. That's what it was under uh, Condoleezza Rice. She came and met with me. I met with a number of my successors. Right. We don't need to recreate the Department of Defense, the Department of State, the Department of Homeland Security over at the White House. We've got great diplomats and soldiers and, and folks that can that do that work for us in the departments. Just to button that up, though, uh, you're saying Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is scheduled to rotate out. You are not suggesting in any way that there will be retaliation against him. I, I, I never retaliate against anyone. So the, the, it's but his like, time is coming the, to an the, end. There, there will be a point for, for everybody who's detailed there okay. uh, that their time that their detail will come to an end. They'll go back to their agency. And what we want them to do is take the experience and skills they learned at the White House, take it back to their departments and agencies, and, and, and do an even better job there. And, and so we're, we're grateful that we can have these detailees come in. And they'll come spend the year, a year or year, you know, maybe a little bit more at the White House, and mm -hmm. then they'll go back to their agency, and and they'll do a better job at their agency. All right, thank having you very much, House. thank Ambassador you for having Brian, me, for joining us. Appreciate it. We'll be right back with our panel. Don't go away. We turn now to some political analysis from our panel. Stephen Hayes is the editor of The Dispatch and a Fox News contributor. Margaret Talib is the White House and politics editor at Axios. Jeffrey Goldberg is the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. And Antoine Seawright is a Democratic strategist and CBS News contributor. Good to have you all here. Good to be here. Uh, impeachment seems to be sucking the oxygen out of everything here in Washington. Stephen, I want to begin with you because I know you think that this is a bad week for Republicans, but you don't think outside the beltway this is resonating. I don't. I don't think it's really resonating. If you look at the way that Republicans in Congress are reacting to this, it's almost with a shrug of the shoulders. We, we saw these transcripts come out. If you spent time reading the 2,000 plus pages of the transcripts, tremendously damaging to the argument that Republicans have made for the past six weeks in defense of the president. One by one, by one you saw all of these defenses of the president on substance fall away, where it's clear that there was this quid pro quo that Democrats and others have been alleging. Republicans don't have an answer for it, as I think was, was evident in your interview with Senator Kennedy. He said it depends on the kind of quid pro quo. Yeah, I mean, he, he sketched out this scenario where he had, on the one hand, the, the president might have been doing this because he has some vague interest in corruption broadly. But you have to take a step back and think about what that means. I mean, this is a president who has had friendly relations with leaders of 
tremendously corrupt countries, whether you're talking about Egypt or Russia or Saudi Arabia or Turkey, who wants to bring troops home, who's an America firster, but he suddenly had such an interest in corruption in this one country, in Ukraine, that he sent his personal attorney to conduct investigations that happened to overlap, coincidentally, with the interests, his political interests, in, in that they were investigating two of his chief political rivals. It doesn't even pass the laugh test. So, Margaret, wh why then is that not more clear to the public? If it's so clear, as Stephen laid out there, is it that what these public hearings will change? Well, uh, the public hearings can only change people's minds if people watch the public hearings and are engaged in them or read about them. And I think uh, it's pretty clear from the early weeks of this that, that President Trump's base is not shaken or uh, thwarted by this. Uh, and so really the issue is the group we're going to be hearing a lot about in the next several months, which is the suburban voters, right? These are the, you, if you call the moderate voters or swing voters or suburban voters, somewhere in that circle is, is this group of people. Um, we saw the relevance of suburban voters in Virginia in the elections, perhaps to some extent in Kentucky. And this is the group that uh, both Democrats and President Trump are now going to be fighting for because they are the people who are uh, engaged in, um, mm -hmm. you know, in sort of the daily business that involves paying attention to more details like this. And uh, they are the people who are most likely to be at a workstation at work with the TV on absorbing the contents of this, trying to figure out whether they are uncomfortable enough about it that they won't vote for President Trump twice. Antoine, how do Democrats avoid what happened with the Robert Mueller hearings, where there was this big buildup and the idea that if he testifies publicly, he'll describe in vivid detail what people didn't bother to read in print. How is this going to be different? Uh, I think we have to first come to the real realization that Donald Trump and his disciples have no interest in having a relationship with the truth, regardless of whether it's public or whether they actually read it and can see it. Number two, I think Democrats have to block and tackle, block out this arguments or this distraction that the Republicans want to draw them into and really tackle the issues that matter to the American people while they also pass legislation that they promised the American people in 2018 and remind people that it's the Senate is the hold up is the problem and everything goes to McConnell's graveyard to die. If we fail to do that, we will be sentenced again to two years in the hard time as the minority party. Do you think it's going well? I, it's hard to say. Look, here's what I do know. The Republicans uh, demonstrated what I believe to be a political pump fake about transparency during this process when you had 47 and 48 members of their conference a part of these hearings. Now they're public and you have leaders like Senator Graham and others who want to press the ignore button on the fact they're going to be transparent and essentially they're saying regardless of what comes out, no matter who says it, like a decorated uh, military official, it's not true because it's anti-Donald Trump. And we've seen this move before, and that's why I think Democrats have to stay focused on the things that matter outside the bubble. Jeffrey, who's actually winning on the messaging here and convincing the American public? Because that's what these public hearings are going to be focused on. I think it's actually, this sounds very journalistic, but I think it's too early to tell. Um, we don't know what dynamic we, we enter when we actually see these people live in front of the cameras and how many people are watching and how convincing it is. I mean, on the one hand, uh, we'll know the answer to that question, I think. Not so much, I mean, we'll know it when we see what people in the suburbs feel about it. We'll also really know the answer if we see re Republicans become less cohesive. If there's one person uh, one person with influence in the Republican Party uh, on the Hill who says, you know what, the emperor really doesn't have his clothes mm -hmm. on. Um, that could uh, sort of break this open a little bit because all of us, I think, up here talk to Republicans on the Hill who privately say this is a disaster, a moral disaster, a political disaster, an ethical disaster, and they're just holding on and they're coming up with these talking points that, mm -hmm. that you saw on your show today. Uh, but there's a belief, and maybe this is an over-optimistic belief on the part of Trump's opponents, that there are people there who will say enough is enough. When they hear it from, as you say, a mm -hmm. decorated war veteran, this is actually what happened. When they hear it from, from serious professionals from the State Department, they might just say enough. But Margaret, here's the one thing Democrats and, and Republicans agree on, mm -hmm. the interests of national security. 
And I think if Democrats use that as their North Star or their foundation about this being about national security and the future of this country, I think that is a point that no one can argue. Well, in the meantime, the, the split screen uh, will be these hearings happening in Capitol Hill while the president is meeting with another world leader that he is dealing with national security. I, I was pressing, uh, Jeffrey, the national security advisor, on why Turkey's leader deserves the honor of walking into the White House. <laughs> and after after listing all of the things that Turkey has done wrong. Right. And, and as you know, there's a hope in Washington that simply that Erdogan leaves without having his bodyguards beat up people. <laughs> as because that's what last happened. Time. We have lower standards for this visit than we usually have, which is like, let's not, not have street violence associated with this visit. No, this the, 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 the uh, reception of Erdogan this week doesn't make any sense from a national security perspective. Are you rewarding? Remember, we always talk about rewarding people with an Oval Office visit. Is this, is this the person? who deserves an Oval Office visit? No, uh, of course not, but nothing is particularly coherent in our national security strategy right now. So it makes as much sense as anything else in this kind of topsy-turvy world in which we live. You were referring to in 2017 when American protesters were beaten up. There are U.S. Marshals arrest warrants out right. for some of Turkey's, uh, the Erdogan's bodyguards. Right. We'll see if they show up on this visit. <laughs> um, we'll be back in a moment with a lot more from our panel. Don't go away. And we're back with more from our political panel. Uh, Stephen, I want to start off with you. The Journal has a, an op-ed. And, you know, their op-ed pages are often thought to be fairly conservative. Sure. So when they say Bloomberg waters warm jump right in uh, to Michael Bloomberg, suggesting he get into this 2020 race and that it might be a good idea, um, are, should Democrats be skeptical of that somewhat endorsed <laughs> Sounds like a trick. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is a little trick. Look, I think Democrats probably should be skeptical uh, of Michael Bloomberg for, for a number of reasons, most especially because he's done this before. I mean, we've had how many head fakes from Michael Bloomberg? And he's also, you know, he was Democrat, Republican, Independent. He sort of covered the gamut. And I think you're hearing this from people like Elizabeth Warren, people like Bernie Sanders, who I think are more in touch with the, the sort of uh, base of the Democratic Party, that this is not the, the, the Democratic savior that, that people But is he the kind of candidate who could convince Republicans to cross over and vote well, for him? Well, I think conceivably, um, I mean, he certainly has some nanny state aspects to him that I think would make conservatives uh, uncomfortable. But I think the immediate impact is much likely to have the opposite effect, where he, he dilutes support potentially for Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. He could block a path forward for others who are running in the so-called moderate lane like Buddha Judge, uh, Amy Klobuchar, and others. So I think if you're Elizabeth Warren today and you see uh, Michael Bloomberg getting in, you're happy. Mm -hmm. Antoine, you know, being a self-made billionaire, successful business person, you can look at that and say it's the American dream. Or you can look at that and say, this person is suspect. And it seems that this person is suspect is what we're hearing more on the campaign trail. And that isn't comfortable for everyone. I'm not going to criticize him for making money. Um, but let me say four things about Bloomberg. Number one, most people will agree that the political highway is experiencing a traffic jam because <laughs> we have too many people running for president on our side and most of the lanes are filled at this point. The second point is that it's Sunday morning, so I'll say this. There's a political scripture that I reference that says the road to heaven in the White House runs through South Carolina. Well, he has agreed that he will not participate in the South Carolina primary where 61 percent of the people who will vote, cast their vote will be African American, 55 percent women. Most of the states that follow reflect South Carolina. South Carolina was a launch pad for Barack Obama and a safe haven for Hillary Clinton. Also your home state. Oh, <laughs> okay. God's country. <laughs> and, and then the third thing, it is the home of the most prominent and powerful African-American in the U.S. Congress, Jim Clyburn. And so what Bloomberg is saying by not participating in the South Carolina primary, if he gets in, is that I have no interest in what majority of African-Americans think in the South and especially the home of Whip Jim Clyburn. That's where I think he's making a mistake, and I call it the highest act of malpractice any campaign can commit. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret. Well, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why a bid would be complicated, and I think we're not sure yet that he is going to run. Uh, there's no way to secretly check the box in Alabama without people right. finding out. Hmm. Uh, but but there, there, the case to be made, if he did pursue it, is that what he's done with his billions of dollars uh, is invest in two of the most important issues to Democrats on climate change and on gun control, right? 
uh, at, that he's got support in Wall Street, he's got some support in Silicon Valley as well, and that uh, when you look at the results of last Tuesday's election, uh, there, it, there may be a market of people in the general election, yeah. maybe, uh, that would be receptive to a message like his. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, uh, there is also an overarching lesson from the 2016 race, which is that when you have a 17-way or an 18-way or a 19-way right. primary, <laughs> somebody who did not have a chance in a three-way race right. could have a chance. Right. And that is all part of the can't, calculus. You cannot be the, the Democratic board. nominee without having strong, across-the-board, broad, deep, and wide support among African-American voters. He does not have that. Jeffrey. But I, I do want to say one thing in his defense, or in the theoretical defense of this candidacy. Unlike the other billionaires who are really vanity candidates, this is a proven election winner. I mean, this is a three-time mayor of New York City. As a Democrat, uh, Republican, and independent. I mean, I mean, he's <laughs> covered all the bases. Uh, I mean, so so he has overcome a first hurdle. He's actually gone before voters and gotten votes, and by many accounts, had had a largely successful run mm -hmm. as as mayor. So I think it does put him in a slightly different lane than just the pure vanity billionaire fast lane but it is well, the biden but it is the biden lane right. and, it, and it complicates that contest inextricably all right thanks to all of you for the analysis we will be right back Sixty-five years ago, the very first guest on Face the Nation was Senator Joe McCarthy, a politician who rose to prominence on the audacious claim that communists had infiltrated the U.S. State Department. The hearings and blacklisting that followed are looked back on as a dark period in American history. It serves as a good reminder that it is not entirely new to have this anger, vitriol, and divisiveness in our country's politics. And looking back at the world leaders who have appeared on this program through the years, I'm also reminded that upheaval and change are constant, even if they are disorienting. These days, you've never had so many options at your fingertips to quickly receive information or disinformation. Talk is cheap and you can get an opinion just about anywhere. Face the Nation has always been a place for listening to each other, which we all need to do a bit more of in our current climate, and for context and perspective. That's what our team here at Face the Nation will continue to try to do each Sunday. And at 65 years old, we're in our prime. We want to wish the United States Marine Corps a very happy birthday. They turned 244 today. We honor all who currently or previously served in the armed forces and their families on this Veterans Day weekend. Thank you all for keeping America safe. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.